And tonight is a very unusual subject. So uh, what we're gonna be talking about tonight is a combination of a computer issue, a power issue, a Boston issue, and a library issue, all mixed up together in one exciting, scary, sinister, interesting <laughs> subject. Uh, so I'm gonna begin um, by talking about this very common word that you hear all the time now, but I'm not sure that we all fully understand what it means. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking together about what Adam, this word means. Adam, this is Steve Eisenberg. Can I just say one thing, please? Please, Steve. Um, during the course of you giving a presentation, could people please mute their microphones unless they're specifically asking a question? Because that'll prevent uh, coughing and other noises from coming in. Thank uh, you. I, I will just a counterpoint to that is if you want to make a spontaneous reaction noise, do turn your microphone on to chuckle or snarl or whatever it is you want to do. Uh, we, we do want this to be a meeting where people can react and, and speak. Uh, so uh, the word is this word that's become so prominent in our culture. Um, and the word is algorithm. And uh, it turns out that this word um, comes from uh, a person. The, the word algorithm is actually named after somebody. Um, it comes through Latin and, and so forth. But what it really is, is um, it's, it's the name of a great mathematician named al Khwarizmi. Um, who is also known as Abu Jafar Muhammad Ibn Musa, and that's only part of his name. Uh, he was the person who first wrote works on uh, algebra. And so the word algebra also is derived from a similar root. Um, he uh, was extraordinarily talented and smart and also a great doctor who cured um, the emir and many other people and made a good living as a doctor. Um, this is a statue of him looking at an astrolabe over here on the right. And his book, the compendious book on calcul calculation by completion and balancing, for those of you who remember your high school algebra, completing the square, does everyone remember this? Uh, he invented that. And he was the first person to, um, to, and in fact, the word algebra means rejoining. And it's a reference to this process of completing the square. Uh, you can read all about this. And there, there's actually some really good, um, uh, there's even a, 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 an, an animation of completing the square. Why does this person's name live on in Google? The reason why is that Google, the search engine, was created as an algorithm. So let's talk about what this word means in the modern, in modern parlance. Uh, the father of algorithms is a man named Donald Knuth. And he wrote a book called The Art of Programming. And he was very, he's a very, very smart man. He's still teaching. And you can actually download for free The Art of Programming. Uh, it is a beautiful book. Uh, world, absolutely the Bible for anyone who is a computer programmer. And he wrote it a long time ago. Um, he was born in 1938. He's an elderly fellow now. Um, and uh, I think it was first published, we got a, a date here? Someone say copyright date? Um, I see 97. Yeah, but it was, long, that was the, the ninth printing. First, I guess, I guess 97. I guess so. Um, but, but I think, so uh, he opens it by saying, by quoting McCall's cookbook. Now, this is not a coincidence. He opens with this quote, here's your book, the one your thousands of letters have asked us to publish. It has taken us years to do so, checking and rechecking countless recipes to bring you only the best, only the interesting, only the perfect. Now we can say without a shadow of a doubt, that every single one of them, if you follow the directions to the letter, will work for you exactly as well as it did for us, even if you've never cooked before. So an algorithm is really a recipe. It's a step-by-step -step procedure 
for accomplishing something. Why has it become so important? Well, let me first show you, uh, Donald Knuth begins his book with an example of an algorithm. And I, I wanna go through it with you um, because it'll give you a feel uh, for what a language, what an algorithm is. Uh, by the way, he did write, he did write it in the 60s. That, that 1997 date is wrong. Thank you very much. I, th I thought so. It's been around. It's, but he, in the 90s, he wrote, this is still a work in pro progress. Right. Like, so this, this goes way, way back. Um, he actually wrote the computer typesetting program that he used to publish it called Tex and Metathon. Um, so yeah, so this is a, a, a long ago republishing. Um, he quotes Bill Gates in 1995 saying, things have changed in the past two decades. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is an example of, of how he recommends you read the book. It's a flow chart. Start in, read a chapter, relax, read another chapter. Okay. So um, he's, he's fooling around. Uh, computer people have, have funny senses of humor. Uh, he quotes um, this uh, various great authors at the beginning. But let's, let's look at an algorithm. Uh, this, by the way, is really great fun. The opening quote is from the illegitimate daughter of Lord Byron, Augusta Ada, the Countess of Lovelace, who is considered the first computer programmer. She was a woman, and she was an, a partner of Charles Babbage, uh, who, and together they had a scheme to create a, a computer that would then they used to bet on the horses and become very rich. The, the computer was never built because they didn't have the engineering to build it. Uh, it was later built in the 90s at MIT, and it worked. Uh, so it had some really good ideas. Um, and so he starts talking about algorithm. Um, its origin is really interesting. It comes from this guy, this algorithm guy. Um, and gradually it got associated with Euclid's algorithm, which I just want to spend a moment talking about because it will get us in the, in the mood to talk about algorithms. So this is Euclid's algorithm. What, what is Euclid's algorithm and why do we care? So let's take a look. Euclid's algorithm is an effort to solve this problem. Suppose you have a number, 362, and you have another number, which is, uh, say, 270. What number goes into, what is the largest number that goes into both of these numbers? Anyone know? I think you should define what goes into means for it divides in evenly without a remainder. Which, but I would, uh, being a math major, I would say you should specify that as what integer. Well, thank you. We're is. only talking about whole numbers, no fractions. Anyone know? So the high, the greatest common factor, I think, is what you're correct. Saying. You can call it the greatest common factor, okay. greatest common denominator if they were in the bottom of a of a fraction, right? So the reason why I'm asking if you know is that nobody knows. You can't look at these numbers and immediately know what the answer is. You need a process, you need a procedure. And that's what an algorithm is. An algorithm is a process for solving a problem you can't solve just by looking at it. So Euclid's, Euclid's method is actually very clever. We're not gonna walk all the way through it, but what he does is he does some clever divisions and step by step melts these numbers down till they get smaller and smaller. And when they get small enough, uh, you're able to find the, the least common denominator, the greatest common factor. That is very lovely. Uh, what does this have to do with the Boston Public Library? That, here's these three steps for Euclid's algorithm. What does it have to do with the library? Well, it turns out a lot. So in order for us to understand this, I need to tell you a quick story. Uh, does anyone know uh, the names of the two people who own and founded Google? Larry Page and Bryn, Sergey Bryn. Very good. Larry Page and Sergey Bryn. Well, I don't know, but I could Google it. <laughs> so... So I want to tell you the story of how Google got started because it actually is very relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Um, so um, the um, 
just uh, wanted to know if we want to, um, would anyone like to do closed captioning? Would anyone like to do the typing for the closed captioning tonight? Is there anyone available to do that? Okay. Um, Too tired. So uh, let me know if someone feels enthused about doing that, it can be very helpful. Uh, so how did this happen? What happened? Uh, the, the key to this story turns out to be what Larry Page's parents did for a living. Does anyone know? So Larry Page is from Okemos, Michigan. Now, if you are um, uh, know a lot about black history, you would know that Okemos is famous for something, for a very important person who was born there. Does anyone know who it is? Malcolm Little, also known as Malcolm X, was born in Okemos. And does anyone know what his nickname was? Red. Yeah, he was called Detroit Red. So why was he called Detroit Red when he was from Okemos? Because he was a smart guy and he knew that no one had ever heard of Okemos. He'd never been to Detroit in his life, but he called himself Detroit Red so people would know where he was from, basically. So Larry's from Okemos, and Okemos is a suburb of Lansing, Michigan. And does anyone know what university is in Lansing? Michigan State. Now we got a football player, a football fan here. Um, uh, correction, that uh, Michigan State is in East Lansing. Thank you very much. Michigan State is in Greater Lansing. <laughs> um, East Lansing, good enough. The, the point that I want to make is that Larry Page's parents both were professors at Michigan State. And why does this matter for our story? It matters because Larry Page witnessed as a child a very important phenomenon. And the phenomenon is called citation. Uh, anyone oh, here yeah. who's worked in a university, could, could they explain what citation is and how it's important to professors? You have to um, cite an author when you quote it. When you quote an author, you have to write, a, write down a citation of when and how and who and all the other things having to do with that quote. So it's like a footnote that you had to do in, in high school, right? Isn't it also, isn't it also a citation where you got that information from? Exactly. So yeah, a, a, fa a favorite phrase on the CSI TV show was cite your source. Cite your source. They do that Hopefully a lot in genealogy a, too. So, so it turns out that this is both, the purpose of this is so that when you're reading a scientific paper, you can know what this person's basing his stuff on or her stuff on. But it also turns out to be really important for people's careers. Because what's happened is citation has become so important that when your paper gets cited, you get a little, it's sort of like um, those of you have seen, uh, what's that movie? Is it It's a Wonderful Life where there's a little ding when the angel gets its wings? Yep, that's the one. Yeah. So when you get cited, a little ding goes on in the universe of university writing. It's a social and somebody says... Adam Frost wrote the greatest paper on computer backups I've ever read. And I get cited. And forever, my name is associated with this. And somebody says, and then the more people who cite me, the more cited I am. It's called the social bump. It very much a social bump. And it, but it's actually measured. So when people go up for tenure, they, they go up to, to get permanent jobs at universities. One of the questions is, how many people cited your papers? How many people pointed to your papers and said, this person said something that was valuable to my paper? So this is very old. This goes way, way back, but long before the internet, long before Google. But Larry Page witnessed this because his parents were university professors. Larry and Sergey met at Stanford as graduate students in computer science. And they had vague ideas of starting a business of some kind. And they started fooling around with different ideas. And Larry said, wait a minute, nobody can find their way around the internet. It's hard to know which end is up there. Uh, and it's hard to know what sites are valuable, what sites aren't valuable. 
what if I apply this principle that works for my parents' profession to the internet? And so he invented two computer programs. One was called Backrub, and the other was called PageRank. A, a funny pun, um, it was, did not mean web page, it meant Larry page. And these two programs were the first programs that started to say, who points to me? All the other search engines and, and uh, tables of contents to the internet up to that point were about lists of things. But Larry was the first person, and, and then with Sergey, was the first person to say, wait a minute, what really matters for a web page is who cares about it, who points to it, who references it. And so they built this as an experiment and they published it as a paper, <laughs> actually, that got cited. Um, it's a published paper, you can read it. It's published, it's in the public domain, it's not patented or anything, about how Backrub and PageRank work. And then they discovered as very often happens in the history of science, where you um, you get a magnifying glass like Priestley did, you start going around your lab magnifying things, and, and then you find that you burn oxygen. Um, and that's how Priestley discovered oxygen. Larry Page and Sergey Brin discovered that this idea, which was really intended to rank pages and say which were better than others, turned out to be by far, by far, the best searching technique that had been invented. The Google search worked much better when you type something in Google search, it worked really well because it was using this technique of who points to this the most. And this led to them starting a company and getting venture capital and then coming to a crossroads where they decided to change their policy of not accepting advertising. And in some ways it was all downhill from there. Um, but in some ways for them, it was uphill. They, they, they and many people who worked for them uh, became very wealthy and very powerful in the computer industry. And they created this search engine that, which has now, uh, like Kleenex, has entered into uh, the, the language. You say, I Google something. Uh, and the way Google, Google continues to work in exactly the same way it did when Backrub and PageRank was invented. It asked the question, who points to a website? Who points to it, content on a website? And if lots and lots of people point to it, it gets higher in the ranking. And if fewer people point to it, it gets lower in the ranking. Now there's lots more to be said about this. Uh, this gets really complicated. Just to give you a feel of how complicated it gets, go ahead and Google, Google 200 criteria. And you will get to this obsessive website called backlinko.com, which explains in, in Brian Dean's opinion, how Google decides what comes up first and what comes up second. It's very interesting reading. Uh, some of the ideas are, are really interesting. For example, if you go to the Wayback Machine, which I really recommend if you haven't used this, it's incredibly fun. You can go to the Wayback Machine and you can look up old, how long, how, you can look up old websites. So for example, here's an old website. And the Wayback Machine will tell you when this website first appeared and also show you what the website was. It, had took pay, it copied the pages. So IBM first published its website in 1996. And you can go on the Wayback Machine and look at the photograph. This is October, 1996, probably the first, the unveiling of the IBM website. And you can actually double click on this and the Wayback Machine will show you the web pages. They all work, the links work usually, unless they're pointing to a defunct company. Let's see if we can get to it. I'll, I'll try that uh, later on. See if that works a it's thinking. We're going so way back, it has to think really hard. But the point I'm making here is that Google takes into account the fact that IBM.com has existed. So this is IBM's 1996 results, third quarter 1996 results. And as you see, this is not quite as stylish as the new IBM site. And they make available text only sites, if you wish. Um, and uh, it talks about uh, um, IBM Sur Yahoo using IBM servers to launch in Germany and France. And you can read about IBM products. If you click on this, we'll see if that got archived. 
see what IBM was selling in 1996. The point of this, in addition to showing you a really wonderful tool that's great fun and very good for research uh, to look up old companies and find out how long people have been around, uh, there, there's IBM's um, ThinkPad site. There's the ThinkPad from 1996. Uh, it also explains how Google thinks. Google notes the fact that IBM has been around since 1996 and enters that when you type IBM into Google, IBM's website comes first. And that's partly because it's been around for a really, really long time. So Google has all these different factors that it uses to make decisions. How does this guy know this? Did Google publish, does Google publish its criteria? Does anyone know? It's my understanding that they, they don't for various reasons. They do not. And in fact, they, 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 it's a closely guarded trade secret. It's like Colonel Sanders ingredients to the chicken. Um, now, I want you to think about that for a moment. When you search Google, Google, this private, it's a publicly held company, but it's a private company controlled by a small group of people. Google decides what you see based on criteria that they will not tell you under any circumstances. This guy sussed this stuff out by uh, looking at Google patents, by talking to people, by using his common sense. These are all guesses, but nobody really knows. Well, I was appalled when I started to realize that you, you know, paid advertisers could, apart from the ads that they sprinkle in, could, be, could pay to be listed earlier, despite the merits of their, of their site's match. How do they pay? How do they give the money to Google, Mark? Well, I, I don't know, but I, I, inf I gather from other people I've seen, I've talked to, um, that they just pay Google. You know, make, car manufacturers, as I understand it, at one point anyway, could pay them, you know, more than you or I could manage per month to be listed earlier in search results, even though, in my opinion at the time, the given website didn't deserve to be listed earlier because of. Uh, you know, the merits of the keyword matches on the page. Yes, and you can see many examples of this. Um, I'll show you the most shocking and disturbing example. You Google my name, what happens? Do I come up? No, this gardener in England comes up. And he comes up for pages and pages. And also Adam Frost, the, uh, the actor, um, comes up at his fan club and his very handsome picture, but not me. Do you have an avocation? Say again? Do you have an avocation? What, what do you mean? Do you have another job? Uh, are you an actor? Or do you have a... No, uh, no, no, these are not me, and I, I have no connection with them. So, well, well, What so, kind of effort have you put into your social media presence? Well, that's the really interesting question, is why is this gardener on the first three pages... Um, and why do I show up, an obscure computer scientist, on page the bottom of page three? Adam, Adam Frost football, is a, a very player. common English name. Say again? Adam Frost is a fairly common English name. Um, That's probably part of the story. Um, uh, so, it's, so the Britishers come before the Americans. Um, so I say, I say this jokingly because there's no earthly reason why I should come first either. But it's curious. We, I don't really understand um, the effort that this gardener has put into, um, or this graduate student who shows up on page page one. Um, he's a graduate student in the history of entrepreneurship in modern, modern China. So I think the, the main point I wanna make as an introduction to the discussion we're having tonight about the Boston Public Library is that this tool, which has become the predominant tool with which people do research, Google is by far the most used research tool in the world is controlled by a tiny group of people who do not have to answer to anybody ever about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Well, I also conclude that it's time for you to start a newsletter. Oh, well, how, oh because then you think I might beat out this guy? Yeah. Well, or, or blog or, you know, journal or whatever. But, um, I don't, you know, it's not a competition, but that might move you up. Or not. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I think the fact that that 
person is on television and, and that yeah. they've made the effort to get themselves into the internet. It could be, or what if he's a cousin of Larry Page? We haven't the faintest idea. Oh, and there's boy. no, by the way, there's no law against that. If this guy is Larry Page's cousin and Larry Page is quietly posting him in the Google search engine, there is, it's completely legal and ethical even. I mean, it's not like Google claims, Google doesn't say that their system is fair. They just say, it's a system, we, we do it. I don't know, maybe somebody can correct me on that if Google well, does I claim. I, 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 used to, I used to subscribe to a company called I Need Hit. Hey, John, I'm just having trouble hearing you. Oh, okay. Um, can you hear me better now? Much better, thank you. Okay. Uh, I used to subscribe to a, uh, a, a service called INeedHits.com. And it claimed, and with some relevancy, that they would put list you in Google and several other uh, um, places that actually improved the number of people that were actually coming to my website. I I don't know exactly what they were doing, right. but you could pay, and it was like, you know, three or four dollars a month for a small for 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 a small website, you know, twenty dollars a year. So, John, if you take that number and multiply it by what Martin Kadansky is saying. And you're a car manufacturer and it's twenty thousand dollars a month and you give it to somebody at google or a google subsidiary i have no idea how the system works the point that i want to make is that this system is not a community controlled system that's right and i think that's the thing that i just want to underline and yet it has the trappings of being a community thing so google is something everybody uses we are a community we use google hey google it Look it up on Google. And there's the, the, I think, kind of cozy illusion that when you do that, you're doing something as a community. Everyone's doing it. And this is the introduction to, to the discussion about the Boston Public Library. Right. So uh, just a few words about the library. Uh, the Boston Public Library is one of the most beautiful institutions I've ever encountered. If you yeah, go you. downtown to the central library in copley square you will see a plaque donated by the poet khalil gibran one of the most popular poets in literary history who was impoverished and wrote his i think he wrote the prophet his, his most famous book in the boston public library and he um i, I don't know if he donated something but he, he thanked the library he said you know i this library gave me so much. And he's one of countless people, including me, who have been influenced greatly by going into the library and seeing books on the shelf and taking them out and learning from them. This has been something that's helped countless, countless people. And I wanna to talk to you about a threat to the very existence of the Boston Public Library. Um, and the threat comes from partly an algorithm. And so I want to open by saying that um, I, I, and I think a lot of people in this group, value and appreciate technology. We, we are computer, many people in this group are very seasoned computer people. We've worked with computers and other high tech stuff for a very long time, and we respect it and appropriately fear it. I think it's important to recognize in the modern world, the technology has definitely had different sides to it. Um, and I, I'm gonna open with a very dark side, um, but I think it's important that people bear this in mind. I'm Jewish. And so people, people of my tribe know how, how dangerous technology can be. I love trains. I love taking trains, but for us, Trains also have a horrible, horrible memory. This simple technology, which, which was so wonderful for creating, it helped create the United States. It's, it's a technology that allowed me to, to court my wife. It was a, it's a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing. And it was used to murder my relatives systematically over a long period of time. 
So we need to, I, I, I start on that very serious note to say this is not a trivial matter. Technology is not a trivial matter. Um, it can affect the lifeblood of a community. It can affect your life, your very life. And so I want us to approach this with the seriousness that it requires. It doesn't mean we can't joke about it. I mean, we tell Holocaust jokes. It doesn't mean you can't have a sense of humor, but it does mean that you have to appreciate how important this is, how very important it is to recognize what's going on in our culture and to call it for what it is and learn about it. And that's uh, my goal for this meeting today. Uh, just one structural thing about BNUG for those who haven't been to our meetings before. We take a break at 7.30 uh, for 10 minutes, and I'm going to encourage everyone to go away from their computer for the break. Just hang out, do have some food, take a rest, um, and then we'll, we'll resume in, in earnest at 7.40. Um, we're also an ongoing group. We're open year-round. We meet usually the first Tuesday of each month. We're at bnug.org. I encourage you to come to our meetings. We talk about important computer, social, and technological issues. And we have many, they're all also, a, it's a gateway to many volunteer opportunities and involvement in the computer community. All right, so what, what does Google and algorithms have to do with the Boston Public Library? So this beautiful institution where you go in and you take a book off the shelf, I wanna ask the general question for people who are here, how did the books get on the shelf? When you go into the Hyde Park branch of the Boston Public Library, who put those books on the shelf? Who chose them? Does anyone know? The librarian. Could you be more specific? Which librarian? Head library. Uh, where where known? In the in the branch or in the central library? I believe in, um, there's head librarians at each branch, but I believe yeah. it's the head librarian from the I think that's correct. And we I think we have I know, I know. Go ahead. Is that someone um, speaking? Sorry, hey Adam, this is Tom, how are you? Hello, uh, Tom knows a lot about the Boston Public Library. Uh, I go do. ahead, Tom. Uh, well, I had worked there for, until very recently, 15 and a half years. Um, so, the, so what I can say is, and I am not um, familiar with the exact details, but yeah, um, so the branch librarians up until recently, were able to select at least a portion of their collections, but there has been more recently a move to uh, centralize what's called, so who buys the books, the, the word for that in library land is collection development, uh, at least for the circulating collection. And there are really only two or three major suppliers of books um, for the circulating collection that exist. There's Baker and Taylor, there's Ingram, there might be one or two others, but it's it's very consolidated and it's very centralized. Um, Are they using Google to decide? No, the vendors have their own algorithms that they sell to libraries saying if you if you input your demographics, um, if you are, for example, if you're the Boston Public Library, let us know what your what what your certain, you know, how, how many people are in your service community. I don't know if they ask for specific demographics, but they basically spit out, uh, you know, it's like you're a library of this size in this type of city, these are the books that you should buy. And then there's somebody that presses a button and says, yes, we'll buy these. Um, up until recently, the, the, the branch librarians were able to select their own books based on community, community input and, and the sense that they had of their own communities, what they, what they should put on the shelves. Um, but that was recently taken away from them and it, it, it turned into a very big issue. And I'm not sure if it's totally resolved. So for example, I live in Jamaica Plain. And sure, you can plug in demographics of Jamaica Plain and, and come up with you know, certain percentages of certain ethnic groups or, or socioeconomic classes, but, but who really knows what Jamaica Plain is about? Who knows that Jamaica Plain played a role in the history, played a significant role in the history of, of the brewing industry, played a significant role in the history of um, sewage systems, which the two are actually related. The branch <laughs> library, believe it or not, the two are related. So there's the Stony Brook sublimation project and all that. Anyway, um, but the branch librarians know this and this is why they became librarians. And this is why they ostensibly took their jobs as branch librarians because they wanted to have that power to select their own collections. This is this is why I'm going to say we, even though I'm a I was a different type of librarian. This is why 
we become librarians is to respond to our communities and to re respond to our community history, our community sensibilities beyond just simple demographic numbers. And, and, and that is being stripped away um, for the sake of efficiency, for the sake of, that, that's it, efficiency. I mean, that's, you know, let, let's, let's, and, and that's the difference, in, in my opinion, the difference between a library and a, and a Barnes and Noble, not, not, not that there's anything wrong with Barnes and Nobles or Googles is, you know, there is that community input and yes, it, it, it might cost a little more and yes, it might take a little longer or, or sometimes a lot longer to fulfill um, some of these selections, but that's why we're a library and we're not a Barnes and Noble, so. So thank you for having me, by the way. I, I, so great to have you, Tom. This is my uh, first BNUG meeting. Welcome, welcome. So uh, I chime in. Um, a ahead, friend of mine got married uh, uh, at the Boston Public Library um, a couple of summers ago before the pandemic. Cool. Um, and it was, I forget the details, and I wasn't there, but it was of massive personal significance both to him and his bride. Mm -hmm. um, given their connections to Boston and the photographs I saw of the wedding and the the, the amazing, you know, court internal surrounded courtyard. Sure. Um, that I wasn't even, I've been there once or twice in my lifetime, um, probably decades ago. I wasn't vaguely even aware of a courtyard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of people being, don't even know that exists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Stephen King's son got married there too, just as a FYI. And he, so he, uh, I think his real name is John Hill. I forget, he, he writes under some pseudonym, but he wanted to get married by a librarian in a library. And my friend Jessamine West married them at the BPL, it was, I was gonna say about five years ago. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so th th I think Tom has um, set kind of, I'm delighted Tom has stolen my punchline uh, because I think at, at the heart of what I wanna talk about is this shift from community discussion and learning to centralization and control. And I wanna talk about this shift um, both as computer people and as citizens, because I think it affects us in both ways. So uh, let's first talk about some of the details and then we can uh, talk about how this affects the library, but also it affects other institutions in Boston that I'd like to talk about. So uh, if we, um, Go back here. I'm, I'm at the website for the program that's used by many libraries, including the Boston Public Library. Mm. So this program is called ESP. Uh, and it revolutionized collection development. It harnesses the same machine learning methods that drive Apple's Siri, Google's Assistant, and the recommendation engines at Netflix and Amazon to predict how current and forthcoming titles will perform in your library's collection. Right. Okay. Now let's talk about this, the meaning, because I think this is really central to this discussion. What does performance mean in a library? What is, what is it that we're trying to do? They're, they'll answer the questions with these cute little icons. You'll maximize circulation, meaning you'll, I guess, have lots of books and send them out to lots of people. You'll reduce dead items. A dead item, by the way, is not an item that nobody reads. And a dead item, I think the technical definition is an item that's only taken out once a month or something like that, some measure. It's yeah. not a book that no one reads. Correct. But the word dead is used. Increase turnover exactly what that means. And meet the needs of your community. Notice the order of this. <laughs> no. um, and meet the needs of your community is a kind of euphemism. Last. It's last. It's last. And the, now I, I really want to talk about this because when we think about what an algorithm is, and what it does, and we think about needs, uh, this is, I think, a really important concept for us to wonder about. Um, my own belief, um, how many people here have heard of a man named Barton Gregoria? Couldn't tell you. Doesn't sound familiar. Barton Gregoria died uh, about two weeks ago, and he was the man who rescued the New York Public Library. 
<laughs> uh, he was a, a university administrator who actually wanted to be president of the University of Pennsylvania and he was passed over. And so wow. he went to work for the New York Public Library. But he's the kind of guy who doesn't let grass grow under his feet. He worked really hard. And he transformed the New York Public Library in many positive ways. But one of the things that stuck in my mind was I read an article about him taking over the library. And he called the staff together, the entire staff of the library in some kind of very large auditorium, I guess. Um, and he got on the microphone and he said, yes. fellow educators, Can't hear. I, I want to really talk about this for a minute because I think it not only affects the library, but it affects us as computer people uh, in all kinds of ways. It affects us as citizens. Uh, being a provider is not being a panderer. <laughs> Giving people what they ask for is not necessarily a good thing to do. Uh, we know as computer people, if a customer comes to us and says, oh, don't bother about that silly backup stuff, um, I need to have my website colors improved. A good computer programmer says, I'm very concerned about the colors on your website. I know that's important for your bottom line. I will help you with that. But if you don't do your backups, you could be put out of business. And I, if I didn't tell you that, I would be irresponsible. This is unpopular and irritating and our job. You, fire marshals don't say, all right, you can have the bicycle in the hallway. That, that we, when you're a professional, you're playing a role of guidance and support. And guidance does not always mean giving people what they ask for. It often means saying, yeah, you're asking for that, but I happen to know that that book is really badly written and I know a much better one that will change your life. <clears throat> That's what a good librarian does. Now, yeah. I know that this becomes a joke. Uh, any, any other Music Man fans here? The musical, The Music Man? Yeah, it's okay. It's interesting. It's a great musical by Meredith Wilson about a con man named Harold Hill who goes from town to town selling uh, imaginary boys bands and then running off with the money. <coughs> but he has the misfortune of coming to River City, Iowa, uh, in which a librarian named Marion um, runs the local library. And uh, so he falls in love with her and the rest is history. But uh, yeah. there's a song early on where Marion complains to her mother that she says, I can't help understand, since the Madison Public Library was entrusted to me for the purpose of improving River City's cultural level, I can't help my concern that the ladies of River City keep ignoring all my counsel and advice. And her mother replies, darling, when a woman's got a husband and you've got none, why should she take advice from you? Even if you can quote Balzac and Shakespeare and all those other highfalutin Greeks. So yes, librarians, you can make fun of librarians, but when they do their job right, they make the difference. Uh, a young person coming into a library with a good librarian is a young person who has the, has the possibility for growth and change that exists on no else culture. And so I want to emphasize that libraries are not, it should not be, places that give out the most popular books in the largest numbers. That's not what a library is. But I'm going to go further and say that if a library becomes that, if a library's function is to do what these people want us to do using evidence-based circulatory information. To go to, to Tom stealing my punchline, this is the punchline. The punchline is if you do this, you maximize circulation, you reduce dead items, you increase turnover and well, maybe meet the needs of your community, you are Barnes and Noble, you are Amazon. That's right. Exactly. And the moment, here's the, here's the punchline of that. The moment you become Amazon, you are useless and you will be abolished. No city or state is going to take tax dollars to fund something that Amazon is doing better. Yep. It's not gonna happen. But Adam, Adam, isn't the Boston Public Library part of the Minuteman? 
library system? So um, it's not, right? Yeah, all it is. All yeah, yeah. The books in that system are available to the patrons. I mean, that's I'm because the Boston Public Library gets state funding to. Um, you don't have to live in Boston to get a, a, a BPL card. So Minuteman, there's a bunch of different networks out there and they're all covered by the BPL. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that the BPL is a member of Minuteman. It means there's actually a step, step above that. Um, the, the, the Boston Public Library is statutorily, has been statutorily declared the library for the Commonwealth, which basically means, so, so most other states have a state library that coordinates different networks. In Massachusetts, the, what is nominally called the state library is, mm. is really just, so there is a Massachusetts state library, but it does not have, it, it's, it's really just the library of the legislature. It, it's not a state library. So, so statewide functions in Massachusetts are divided between the Boston Public Library, the Massachusetts Library System and the, Mass, and the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Um, okay. So, a consortium. so each, Guess, the, the way that I understand it is that each uh, area of, say, uh, the Western Mass area, the Central Mass, and then the Eastern Mass has diff different districts, and they, they function within a, that group. But they're, I think they're able to go, I think, and you correct me on it, Tom, that they're able to, um, if somebody in Western Mass wants a book, yeah, CMARS, that's right. Wow, uh, who's Guy Harris? You know your stuff. <laughs> So I guess CW so, Mars. Yeah. So I live in Newton, but I'm a patron of the Waltham Public Library. Sure. And a friend of the Waltham Public Library. Yep. And a few years ago, one of the things that one of the advantages of being a friend is that I'm just not true about books as far as I know, but you can recommend movies. And so I recommended a, a Michael Caine movie, Get Carter, that they actually purchased. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how much circulation it gets. Clams. But, hey, clams. But, there's that. And then um, the other thing is, the other day, um, Ed Ward, who used to do a uh, history of rock and roll for, um, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember, public radio anyway, um, died. And I thought, well, he wrote a book. I, I have one of his books, one of the books he co-wrote, um, uh, which is a Rock of Ages, which is a history of rock and roll. But he also wrote a, a rock and roll volume one and volume two and he did a volume three but it was never published and anyway so i asked for a copy from paul fan of uh rock and roll history of rock and roll volume one and they got it i think it yep. came from watertown because they didn't have yeah. a copy of themselves yep so so massachusetts has a very strong um uh network of libraries and a lot of that is because of the boston public library um, the reason that there are sub networks is because um, you guys are all computer people. The the software that runs the catalogs are they're extremely expensive, and they're not just catalogs. It's basically so it, it's it's a database that has to deal with with uh, patron transactions. It has to deal with inventory description. It has to deal with overdue fines. So, so these are very complex databases and it's too, it's way too expensive for any individual library to afford them on their own, afford one on their own. The, these are, these are pieces of software that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in licensing fees. So, so regional networks will band together and say, okay, let's all chip in and we'll, we'll share a catalog. And mm -hmm. if you're going to share a catalog, you might as well share your books. Right. That, that makes sense. So, yeah. So the, if we um, think about what this centralization, the, the, the database, all this stuff, the thing that I'm, I'm really moved by is how these decisions, the centralization of the library, the use of databases at all. I mean, we used to have those, those little cameras that took a photo of the, of the back cover of the book and, and that's how they knew you had a book out. Mm -hmm. uh, this hasn't been a community process. Like it hasn't been, we as a community have banded together and thought about what kind of library we want, how we want the books to be managed, how, what kind of books we want. And the lack of that process has led to a phenomenon that I, I want to point to because it has affected our computer industry as well, uh, which the phenomenon is this phenomenon of a very small number of people 
making decisions for a very large number of people. Or, or yeah. abdicating the decisions to, to right. an algorithm. That's right. Yes, or not making a decision, letting a computer make the decision. And, and so the, the problem with doing this is that we end up with results which are, shall we say, not optimal. <laughs> no, not optimal at all. Um, matter of fact, the, the, it's a much larger issue. If you go to Google and type, um, uh, algorithms have already taken over human decision making. Well, there's an article, very, very good article. I think you'll probably find that's the one. Uh, and this is an article about how this whole process has proceeded and gives a very, a very beautiful example of a book that was that used an algorithm to figure out how much it, it should cost. And the cost was $23 million for, for a, an obscure book on biology. But a good deal on shipping, John. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget the shipping cost. <laughs> right. Should it be free shipping at that price? Probably. <laughs> We're gonna throw in the shipping. All right, that that brings up a question for me. Go ahead, Sharice. Now, uh, I don't know, month and change ago, month and a half or so, uh, I saw a thing on TV where it turns out that uh, Google algorithms are racially biased. Yep. Yes. They, they as an example, they gave. Uh, Latanya Sweeney. She's a PhD in uh, computer science. She was the first woman of color to graduate from MIT with a um, PhD degree or any degree, I think. And um, she's written a number of articles and books. And she was being interviewed about uh, an article that she had recently written. And uh, the reporter asked if she, if he, if he could see a copy of the article. So she googled her name, and what was the one of the first hits that came up? See the arrest records for Latanya Sweeney. <laughs> and the reporter said, "To hell with the article! I want to see your arrest record." <laughs> now she's never been arrested. The thing is, the Google algorithms, if it's a black sounding name, then they err oh. towards uh, yeah. the negative. If it's a white sounding name, then they err towards the positive. Yeah. Yep. There are very, and, and that, that's, and that that's has, unconscionable. Um, and there no, are very, no. re and there are very recent, uh, very recent um, uh, uh, citations of Google and the other search engines basically snuffing out um, articles and papers written about Palestine and Israel and the origin of Israel uh, uh, and, 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 and the whole discussion of the Israeli-Palestine so-called conflict yeah. um, in, in favor of Israel and against Palestine. Uh, there was actually an effort by um, it, it never came to pass, but there was an effort by uh, 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 Facebook to remove Palestine as a, a, a as a place. Huh. That's unconscionable. That's absolutely unconscionable. Well, yes, but that's what we we're talking about: is that people, you know, three or four guys in a room are making decisions for us about the decisions that are that that. That about the things that we think we're making decisions about, but we're not. We're not. We're 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 doing this. John, take a look at this statistic from the paper you quoted. Eighty-five percent of all trading in the foreign exchange markets is conducted by algorithms alone. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There's no. There's no. There's no traders on the floor anymore. When you, yeah. Adam, when you were um, when you were keying in on article earlier about how books are selected now. And you zeroed in on the word, word "perform." Yes. Um, basically, that is the way the world has gone, or part of the world, in terms of that wonderful word "productivity," in terms of being able to perform at a higher level at a quicker pace for less using less resources. Doesn't mean they're correct, but that's the way the world has gone. 
Right. And, and if, if, if you don't mind me interjecting. Go ahead. Um, so this is one of the major problems that I see with, with and, and maybe it wasn't as much as a problem 20, 40, 50 years ago. The, the, the number one um, metric for library success is circulation which in any, under, any other industry would be ridiculous. It's, it's, it's transactional. It means absolutely nothing. It means somebody came in, picked up this book and left it and, and, having, and, and left the library with it. I've got three kids and I can tell you that they check out books all the time and they sit on, they, they, don't, they don't read them. They, they sit <laughs> under the, so, you know, all, all of these algorithms, all of these algorithms are based on, you know, like, like you just said, performance. So, but, but and, and this, is a, this is a bigger discussion, like, you know, but what, how are libraries defining what successful performance is? And as long as they stick with circulation, it's going to keep going in this direction. And circulation is, is a, is a false, um, is a false metric. I mean, you can infer stuff from it obviously if, if if lots of people are checking out books there's there's probably going to be a higher percentage of people that actually read them and actually learn something from them but the fact that a book moves from one spot to another means absolutely nothing so uh where i want to go from here is a, a couple things i want to continue this discussion uh here people have um things they want to say to enrich it i have a comparison that i'd like to make um, based on a profound political experience I've had in Boston since I've been here. Uh, so I'll share that a little bit to provide some contrast with this library situation. And then we can, we can talk more. So the contrast is, um, I don't know how many people here ever shop there. But when I first came to Boston, my then girlfriend said to me, oh, you see this store here? I think you would really like this store. And so she, she later, I think, regretted this enormously um, because she was introducing me to the Boston Food Co-op where I became very involved. Um, and um, we're just gonna make sure that's not one of us, our people. Could one of our meeting hosts please mute Norm? Um, sorry about that, okay. So, um, uh, I, I like to, if people are stuck outside the meeting, I like to be available in case someone's calling. So uh, the Boston Food Co-op was started about now, about 45 years ago as a hole in the wall in, in BU by some people who wanted to share food with each other. And it evolved into a full-fledged food co-op. And I just want to talk about food crops for a moment because I think they, they shed some light on what's happening at the Boston Public Library. Food crops were de designed exactly to deal with the problem that we're describing. So food crops were an effort that people who started food co-ops in the 60s were reacting to a food system that had become consolidated, that had become performance oriented, that had metrics that weren't the metrics of is the soil healthy? Are the farmers healthy? Is the food healthy? Are you healthy? The metrics were very much like the metrics in a library. How many pieces of food have been sold? Because that number led to sales and sales was the thing that people were measuring. It's very much like measuring the number of books that are in circulation. It's not a very good measure. Uh, the, the measuring things in this way is very common in our culture. For example, the economy is measured by this number called the gross national product. Uh, and uh, mm. we have a friend who's an economist and he points out that if you want to increase the gross national product, you can stage a six car car accident on Route 93. Because what will happen is there will be a vast amount of economic activity. There will be ambulances, there will be medical bills, there'll be lawyers bills, there'll be new cars. But you don't want to have a six car car accident on 93. The consequences, have I lost, can people still hear me? I, my computer wigged out here. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so the, the consequences are horrible. So you can have quote, good metrics. Um, and yeah, you can have good metrics, but if you're measuring the wrong thing, you're in big trouble. 
Um, and so the food co-op movement was an effort. Sometime. The food co-op movement was an effort to measure success differently. So instead of measuring success by the number of products you sold, you measure success by how big a community do you have? How many people are helping each other? How many hours do people spend learning about food? Um, and hold on just a second. Can people still hear me? Yeah. Yep. Good. So what happened with the Boston Food Co-op is it was actually a real food co-op for a while. People came, people did member work, they got discounts, people learned about organic food, me included. People met each other. I got my first job through the co-op. I met lots of friend, lifelong friends through the co-op. It really served its, it served its purpose. But what ended up happening was that, um, hold on just a second, is that the food co-op got taken over by the same group of people who have taken over the Boston Public Library. They're, they're not the same people, but they have very similar ways of measuring. So the people who are running the Boston Public Library now are very concerned about this number, circulation. Are we getting en enough books out? The people who ran the co-op were very concerned about sales, so much so that they started imitating the other stores. And they said, you know, this member stuff, we don't need to worry about this member stuff. They got rid of the member newsletter. They got rid of the member work program. Uh, they got rid of member activities in general. And what ended up happening is the co-op became a pale imitation of Whole Foods. So you would go there and the same products would be on the shelves. They actually tended to be more expensive sometimes than Whole Foods. The service was worse. The location was more awkward. The equipment broke down more often. And because there weren't any member, there wasn't member involvement, people said, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I going to this store to buy inferior food at higher prices when I can just go to a commercial store? Since there isn't any community here anyway. So my warning to us is that this is what's gonna to happen to libraries because it's yeah. what happened to the co-op. The co-op went bankrupt last year. And the reason why it went bankrupt is because all these shoppers stopped shopping there. They had no reason to be there. And uh, I'm, I'm very concerned that that's what's going to happen to us. Well, well Adam, quick, then, quick then what's, your, what's your solution apart from change from within um, legislature, government, um, uh, public outcry? I mean, you know, the private company that is Google can legally do anything it wants. Yes, yeah, and we can legally not use Google. Yeah, and the thing is, Google gets paid by selling its algorithms and its software to its customers. But, I have but a quick Martin, observation Martin, here. Martin's asking a question, and I'd like to throw the floor open to Martin's question, because I think it's really where we should be at this moment. We've recognized a really serious problem. I think my impression is that people here understand what the problem is. Would people like to comment on what they would like to do about this? Or I have a comment. So I've noticed that one reason why circulation is down is because of you know tectonic shifts in the way people get their information, AKA the internet and online sources. And the paradigm there, of course, is very, very different from the print paradigm where a lot of time, effort and expense went into preparing those books, i.e. a lot of quality control, making sure the information mm -hmm. was technically correct, grammatically correct and professionally correct. You don't get that on the internet where anyone can publish regardless of its integrity or veracity. Good point. Jeff, do you, do you have some sense of how we might change this situation? Well, I think it- uh, Oh, no, she said, sorry, I definitely want to hear what you have to say, but I just was asking Jeff and then, then you, if you would- go. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, my personal opinion is that you know, there should probably be some rules established around, you know, when you can, I, you know, publish something. In other words, it should be set up so that you will publish and spread only quality information as opposed to information that, that just promotes what's popular and not necessarily what's right or correct. Well, but who's going to enforce, to create and enforce such rules? Well, that's that's the issue. That's why it's not there yet. That's what you need to talk about. Charisse, do you want to comment? Yeah, it's interesting that um, 
when Google started out, they were very altruistic. It's like the early days of the Boston Food Co-op. And they've become very much like what the Boston Food Co-op uh, degraded into. Because, you know, they were very altruistic. They wanted to do the right thing. They wouldn't do anything for pure profit. You know, pro you know, money would come if they did it the right way. And they've just sunk. Facebook isn't much different. Microsoft is certainly no different. Um, you know, it's just the pure pursuit of profit. So, Sharice, is, do the Charisse, right I, thing. I think we, we're in agreement. We got a problem here. Do you have some sense of what direction we should go in? Just Start Adam, making noise about it as, as computer professionals. Someone, I'm sorry, someone asking a question? Yeah, Adam, this is David Vieira from the Citywide Friends of the Library. Welcome, David. Welcome to the co op. <laughs> Welcome to the co op. I, Welcome to Vina. I, I've been listening to the meeting since it began. And let me give you a little further background. But first, I have to say hello to my friend Tom Blake. Hi, Tom. Is Tom, uh, so, has Tom come back? Yet? Tom had to go to a baseball game and he's going to get oh, resituated. He, he went to the baseball game. No, no, okay, he'll be so, back. He'll be back. Let, so, let, David, let, I, I want let, to hear um, Sharice finish and then, uh, and then we'll go to you. Go ahead, Sharice. That's fine. Thanks. I, I think it's a question of making noise to let Google. Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and Al um, know that you know your first priority should be the pursuit of doing the job and doing the job well, instead of how much money can we make, how much can we increase our stock price, um, how many advertisers can we cater to. So, Sharice, how does some? What I'm trying to understand is, do you want to? change Google's attitude or our attitude or both? I think it's more important that we change Google and Al's attitude. I, just the, the example that I brought up about the, the algorithms being racially biased is just absolutely unconscionable. And somebody pointed out that they you know conveniently erase anything to do with Palestine versus Israel. You know, Israel has a right to exist, so doesn't Palestine. And neither one is going to terrorize or beat the other into submission. So get over it. Thank you, sir. Well, they will try, though. I, I would like to interject. Um, when we had a, sorry, I, I, I should, I was, can, can, can people hear me? Yeah. Better, John, yeah. Okay. Um, when we had a problem in the 1970s, um, which we, we called the Vietnam War, um, People organized against it. They protested. They eventually built a movement that did something that's <laughs> never been done before, which is to stop uh, a war. Yes. Yeah. And that's where I think we need to think about what to do about the Boston Public Library. If there were a public protest movement against what they are doing, if we somehow publicize this attitude, this, this, this algorithmic mechanism, which puts BPL on the tr on track to do the, the right, basically the what happened to the Boston Food Co-op, um, to, to it's doom. Yes. That um, the Boston Public Library needs to stand out and do something different yep. than Barnes and Noble and and I, and I think only public at this point, we don't have any control over these people except for a petition campaign, a mail in letter campaign, an email campaign. These are the things that we begin to, 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 to think about changing people's mind as a result. Of, and I'll give you exa an exa a very good example. Um, I work with um, uh, an organization called City Life. Um, in Jamaica Plain, and they help people uh, with um, with evictions, preventing evictions, and that's the, that's really their goal is preventing evictions. And home home homeless for all is basically what they stand for. And there was a there was a, 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 a an entrepreneur, a, a, a 
a developer who began, who mounted a legal challenge uh, against an organization that wanted to build uh, a, a, a facility for re homeless pe people on their way out of homelessness. So, re so a, re a re recovery program for people coming out of homelessness and getting homes. And this man filed a legal challenge saying, well, these people, um, you, you, you don't have enough parking for them. What a ridiculous thing. I mean, there's no parking necessary for people who are formerly homeless. They don't yeah. have cars. But he launched a legal challenge. And City Life began a campaign of, of mailing him public protests against him, exposing him, going to where, 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 where he works and lived, uh, worked and lived, exposing what he was doing. And he backed down. He withdrew his 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 lawsuit. Mm. Mm. Now th th that's a th just a very good, very small example of what you can do. And that's what City Life does in general with landlords: is they expose the landlord for what they're doing, and very often the landlord backs down and and makes a deal with the with, with the tenant tenant or and, and they also we also. Um, uh, and uh, encourage the formation of tenants organizations. And there's a very large tenant organization at one of these big develop developments where people have been guaranteed that they're not going to be evicted for at least a three or four years. So this, this is this something that you can do via public protest. Um, thank you, John. I, 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 I affirm this. Um, uh, I've read studies of the Vietnam War by right-wing militarists, and they they all say, "Damn it! It was the public. It was the public that stopped us. Yeah. We, we, would have, we would have won in Vietnam if it hadn't been for those stupid protests." Yeah. Right. Well, the and, Black and Lives I'll, Movement. I'll, I'll tell you a very interesting secret about about that that public interest. That public interest overflowed into the servicemen that were there, and they stopped fighting. And that was one of the major reasons why we had to withdraw from Vietnam. That is the service people from Vietnam. And it became a quote, air war instead of a, a, a serviceman air, a war is because they refused to fight. So John, I, I think, well, uh, Martin wants to say something, and, but David was next, so. If, okay, sorry. Yeah, so David and then Martin. Yeah, David, the era. So, um... I'll, I'll make a couple of points. I find the whole discussion very interesting. Um, the first thing is, uh, is Leslie on the line from the Eagles? I don't think branch? she's here. Okay, that's fine. Um, a book that doesn't circulate is not necessarily a book that is not used. Uh, there are many books in the library that are specifically designated as non-circulating books. But in the circulating collection, there are books that are used within the library that never leave the library. So to diminish their importance by saying they're not walking out the door is superfluous. Um, I'll give you another little background. Uh, when I became involved with the Friends of the Library back in the 1980s, the branch librarians had a lot of leeway in what goes on the shelves. We had in Hyde Park, a benefactor that would give the librarian $1,000 every year with the dictate that she goes and buys books on World War II in honor of her husband. Mm. And over the years, we built up a lovely collection of World War II history. And she would go to a, a private bookstore. She would usually go out to the New England Mobile Book Fair and pick out books, bring them to the library and have them uh, accessioned into the circulating collection. They can't do that anymore. Everything has to be approved through the central library system. Yeah. And the 24 branches of our library are becoming homogenized into one great big stew. 
the they're losing this their specialty of neighborhood integration of the system of of the books into the system mm -hmm. um the li the, the 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 library in brighton is much different from the library in fields corner or in hyde park or in mattapan and each librarian knows its audience and that's a lot of what's going on right now Speak to your branch librarian if you live in Boston. He or she will give you some tips as to how to handle this. My other suggestion is to show up at the next trustees meeting in September and uh, make your arguments known there. So that's it. Well, there's somebody here in the meeting that's friends of the Boston Public Library. Yeah, that's, that's me who's just speaking. Okay. That's so, nice. so David, um, the trustees meeting is. Uh, let me just take a look at here. The next one I'm is. Sorry. I'm I'm sorry I didn't look it up. I'll, I'll I'm, get it. I've, I'll, I've got this. I'll, There's one for May 18th, um, yeah, but they don't list a a, a meeting in the September meetings not on their list. I I will um. See if I can find that out for you while this meeting is still in process. So uh, I'll, I'll chime in when I get it. But but I do want to point out that this is the Boston Public Library website. And when you go and look up upcoming Board of Trustees meetings, that there there are no trustees meetings. Usually they are listed, uh, Adam. I, I just want to. Uh, I just want to say that this is an organization dedicated to the public yeah. and the meeting of their primary body of governance does not have an announcement of its next meeting. Oh, Adam, I think you're being a little reactionary. I mean, for all we know, no. they just met and they haven't yet gotten themselves together to schedule the next one. Not to actually, speak, not to speak actually, up for them, but that's still, that's, that's, body. that's, that's up. It's, the summer will be over by that time, and probably within a, a month or a couple. All right, I, 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 I just am frustrated. Oh, I hear. You. Yeah. That that what would be nice would be for them to say when these meetings happen. Like, they must have <laughs> Adam, yeah. excuse me, Adam. Usually, the list of meetings are posted. The reason why they may not have been posted is they just approved the meeting schedule at the last meeting. Okay. And they may not have put it up online yet because it's not until September. Right. So I'm, right. I'm well, going to give them a little pass on that, but let me see if I right, can right. find I'll out. All right. Well, I'm seeing the May 18th meeting was at 8:30 a.m. Yeah. That's a little hard to make, especially for people who are working. <laughs> what, what day was that, Cherise? Uh, was a, that, that was only a, about was a week a and a half ago. It was a Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm going to get mad again. This is a public organization that's supposed to be sharing its information with the public and is having a meeting during a work day when even its own employees couldn't come. That's absurd. Yes, it is. I will make the point that historically in the distant past, the meetings used to be in the evening but that changed back in the 90s. I have made the comment myself that pre-Zoom, uh, normal working people who might have been interested have not been able to attend these meetings. Yep. Since the meetings have gone to Zoom, a lot more people have shown up. Yeah. It's very interesting to see that, dy that dynamic. Yeah, but look at the, uh, the executive uh, you know, the subcommittees, finance and audit, 8 a.m. Uh, all, Thanium all Trust, 3 p.m. Yeah, all, all of them are usually in the morning uh, yeah. now. This is for the convenience of the trustees. Yeah. Right. But, yes. But, yes, but, it is. So at the Boston Food Co-op, the, the um, man, general manager lived in New Hampshire. And so he didn't go to board meetings because it was inconvenient for him. He would, he would call in by telephone. So I, I just just to echo something John was saying, uh, but I want to open this to, to other people to share their ideas about how to move forward. 
Um, Adam, I had a couple comments. Martin, please. Um, uh, not that I was um, uh, of age during the Vietnam War, but I, <laughs> as a side comment, um, one of the things I vaguely remember, and, and I'm happy to be corrected if this is misremembered, um, was there was apparently among the military or the executive branch some discussion of using nuclear weapons to end the war. And apparently the public protests were a factor in, gosh, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that, not because it's an idiotic idea <laughs> uh, or a dangerous and uh, horrible idea, but because of, you know, all that pesky public protests, um, well, I think they the government, have helped sway that decision away. I, I'd say within the government, the, the kibosh was put on, on that. The, the main reason, I mean, one of the things that happened was they got rid of the draft which, which generated a lot of energy among college students um, against the war. Uh, and they also went to, you know, they got rid of the draft. They went, went to a lottery system before that. And then Nixon decided to, to pull out. So, um, my, other, my other comment about um, uh, the algorithm policy issues that Adam is running in the overall meeting um, is in my mind, it's one thing to try to change the course of a um, tax funded um, public controlled institution like the Boston Public Library. It's quite another to try to start influencing the cadre of, of um, either publicly traded or privately run companies that we've mentioned earlier. I mean, I am a business of one. Uh, I'm an older white guy. Um, and, uh, you know, is that discriminatory? Hey, it's up to me whether I hire anybody or not. Um, if somebody doesn't like my policies, well, the buck stops here, but I answer to no one uh, as, unless it's a legal issue. Uh, and it's, it's a little scary to, to, you know, to imagine somebody um, dictating to me how I run my business beyond what's required by you know, the IRS or the, you know, the basic laws surrounding my otherwise unregulated industry. Um, so you know, I, I'm of a couple of minds here. Sure, from a community perspective, we can all feel outcry about how these companies do their thing, but our recourse, you know, you know, shouldn't be the bigger hammer, dare I use that phrase. All right, here's a thought. Here's a thought. Um, here's one huge way to influence the BPL for the better. This year is a mayoral campaign in addition to city council elections. If I remember correctly, I know it's certainly yep. a mayoral campaign. Yeah, How about we hit up the mayoral candidates? What are you going to do about the Boston Public Library, who the system is degrading because they're focused on circulation and you know how much they can get out there versus doing it the right thing? Can I can I chime in there? Yes, please. David from the, from the BPL, the mayoral candidates will not have a clue about what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, okay, and I, I will tell you that the next meeting of the Board of Trustees is on Tuesday, September 28th at 8.30 in the morning, September 28th, 2021, okay. at 8.30 in the morning. Yeah, but the BPL a is a city government, you know, arm of the city government. The, I, the mayor I, I, approves I, the budget. But, but, but David, David, could you explain why you think the mayoral candidates are clueless about this? Well, of course. Um, because they are. <laughs> they, these mayoral candidates are not, don't have the capacity in their campaign to dig into the minutia of what goes on in every single department. Yeah. Um, this, this is something that should be handled on the trustee level and on the BPL management level. This is not necessarily something political. The, the, the city councilors are more apt to know what's going on than the mayoral candidates. Yeah, well, I'm not holding my breath on them dealing with it either. I have my own issues with that. I what, know, about, what about contacting yeah. a media consumer advocate, um, you know, various television stations and, dare I use the phrase, newspapers, 
um, generally have a, you know, consumer problem, you know, line or set of stories. Well, it's very, it's yeah, very well could, I, could I shift the question a little bit to everyone and ask, is this an issue? Uh, it is an issue I, I obviously feel really strongly about. It sounds like several other people in this group feel strongly about it. Could, could some of the people who haven't spoken, do you, would, you, would anyone like to weigh in on this and, and say whether you feel strongly about it and what your thoughts are? <sighs> Let's be a little quiet so people who want to speak. Whether we feel strongly about it or not, it's not going to attract enough attention in the city of Boston. Um, with everything, with the other things that are going on in terms of coming out of this pandemic, in terms of uh, finances of the city, um, in terms of who, who will be mayor, possibly, uh, it's not going to draw enough attention. That's not to say it's not important, but it's not going to come close enough to the top of the list unless literally everybody in the city of Boston or a good portion of the city of Boston raised it as an issue. Well, okay. I don't know about that because well, the Black sure. Lives hold Matter hold movement was started I'm, by one person. I'm sorry, what, 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 time, please. what was that, Sharice? The Black what Lives movement? Matter movement was started by one person and look where it is now. Well, it was started by more than one person, but it was also triggered by a series of incidents that kept happening over and over and over and couldn't be ignored. Um, in terms of the Boston Public Library, that's why they have the trustees. That's, what, that's why they put a system in that we're talking about now, um, which unfortunately people haven't have, haven't raised enough noise about. I'm not saying you're not making a valid issue, but in terms of what would need to be bringing this to the top in the city of Boston, I, well, there's not enough time left in terms I, of going into the election. I would say that the, um, there's a, a, a radio show on um, WGBH, Boston Public Radio, mm -hmm. they have an address, BPR, at wgbh.org um, and they do their show from the Boston Public Library. And they had the president of the Boston Public Library on just I think a day or two ago uh, to talk about all the wonderful things that the library is doing. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for all of us here to raise this issue Yep. With epr.org, you know, WG, you put that out in the chat. Org, whatever. Yeah. Well, hey, also, you, speaking of which, the oh, TV on, Therese, show Greater to... Boston. Therese, hold on. I just want to make sure we get this. Um, before yeah. we, before I'm sorry. My question would be. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. One, one at a time, please. Hold on a second. Stan, can you put that in the chat for people? Um, so people who would like to reach out, um, well, can can learn about that and reach out. For and my question would be how many how how long has it been since any of those people have even talked to the mayor going back to Walsh, if not Menino? <laughs> well, uh, so are, are there other um, are there other uh, comments um, that that do other people have some ideas about these are I think really good ideas. There's public protest, there's reaching out to the to um, this broadcasting system. There's uh, there's going to the trustees meetings. Um, there's going to your branch library and expressing solidarity with them. Do people have some other ideas? Uh, someone just posted the address of the union, uh, which which um, is another way. The union has been actively opposing these changes. The the uh, union of librarians. Yeah, are there? Uh, do people have other comments? People haven't spoken yet. Easier said than done, but in terms of what we've seen in business, what we've seen in terms of the library, what we've seen in terms of, as we talked about Amazon and other organizations, how do you, how do, how do you reduce the influence of money? Um, that's because that's basically what, what's, what's taking over um, through our politics, through our business, throughout any form of anything near the top of America, you're gonna find a lot of money behind it 
and how do you how do you reverse that influence? So I have a suggestion um, that I think this group might be able to be helpful with. So one thing I've loved about this group, I've been a member for many years now, and one thing I really like about this group mm -hmm. is how generous everybody is. Mm -hmm. Like generous with their time, generous with their praise, generous with their support. I found that this is a, a group, I've been in other professional groups where people are catty and clicky and not very nice. And one thing I've loved about this group is we're not that way. And we're people who really wanna give of ourselves, of our knowledge, of our skills. And the metaphor for me, which was both of the Boston Food Co-op and the branch library, is the image of being with people and helping them learn, which has been always a, a huge part of what our group has been about. And I'm wondering if one way to oppose this larger trend is for us to dedicate ourselves in some way to do that, uh, either as a group or as individuals, to, to look for time in our schedules when we can find a young person, for example, and help them learn about computers, help them learn about our industry, help them learn about our profession. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if in doing that, the library, I think is a lovely venue um, to, to say, I'm wondering if I, I'm just imagining as we go forward, hopefully out of COVID, but I was even before we end COVID, the COVID regulations, I'm wondering if there would be a way that we could reach out either as individuals or as a group and say, we would like to be present in the library when a young person comes in and wants to be in the computer business or wants to learn about computers. And one thing I'm wondering about is whether the library would like to cooperate with that, whether we could turn to the library and say, you know, we'd like to be part of your resource. When people come in to look for a book about computers, tell them about us. Um, and we will come in and volunteer. We, we, we have people from our group who will come in to volunteer and give a talk about computers uh, or, or to help young people, um, particularly young black women who tend to be excluded from the computer industry. Um, and Latino women to come in and encourage people to be part of our industry. It would have so many benefits for our group. We've been talking for years about growing this group and getting more young people in it. And I wonder if by doing this, I often find when you wanna get involved in politics, the way to get involved is to get involved. So if we actually got involved in the library and we said, we wanna be part of the library, we want the library to be a learning place, not a place where books get circulated. And we actually acted that out. I wonder if it could have a really positive effect. I also think that us being in the library in various ways, either virtually or in real life, uh, would also give us more standing in this discussion. What do y'all think? Oh, it's got some possibilities. Okay. That approach reminds me of how it worked in amateur radio, where you had a lot of people with a great deal of knowledge and you know uh, engineering technical know-how, and a sort of a gap developed between the older generation and the younger generation. And those guys went out and offered to assist all the younger people in learning as much as they could about those things. So, what was the the structure of that, Jeff? Well, there are many amateur radio clubs, sort of you know private clubs in many locations, right? And they typically meet at uh, in um, like church spaces or easy easy to um, not not rent but easy for certain public areas or group areas non denominational areas to um, um. to 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 meet and um, and they meet like on a monthly basis or something like that and it's all typically to promote knowledge and expertise in the area or the field of interest. Um, if I may, uh, I just let everybody know I'm currently uh, an active member within the Boston Amateur Radio Club. Uh, we meet at the Brookline uh, police station once a month, but right now we've been meeting online through Zoom. So I just figured I didn't put that information. Well, I, what I'm wondering, about, village. what I'm wondering about is is how we might how we might organize this as a group, because if if we wanted to, we could actually have a program from BNUD where we we ask for volunteers from this group and and then 
brainstormed about what kind of offering to make. Uh, someone had put in the chat offering to do a presentation on libraries and algorithms at the library, which would be very fitting, I think. Uh, but we could also think about how we might structure this, how we might be a presence at libraries that uh, this image of a young person coming in and steering away from the graphic novels towards something really okay. special that will help them. Um, it's an image I find really powerful. And I'm wondering, um, just could, do people know how to raise their hand uh, on, on Zoom? There's, there's a thing called reactions. Does everyone have that button? Yeah. Yes, of course. Could I see a show of hands of people who might be interested in volunteering for a project like this? Using some of your private time, your professional time to, to reach out to some young people in some kind of way that made sense with your life? So I'm, I'm gonna, sorry, I had to drop out for a little bit. Well, I know that we have a lot of oh, people. Hold on, see, I, see, I just want to, I just want to get everyone's attention on this for a moment. So, do people know how to do that with their, with their reactions? Yeah. So if you're if you're if you're interested, I just want to get a sense of the meeting, whether there's there's interest in, in this idea of Norm, being, John, Jay, yeah, performing this. Yeah. Uh, additionally, I might add, um, I'm in the process of putting together um, a, a mini course of videos and presentations of my own to uh, a... Um... Hold on, John, before we move on to that. Okay, I, yeah, I'm, do I, I'm hold doing on exactly what you're talking about, which is that a presentations about how computers work. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, what I want to get a sense is, so you're definitely somebody who, who sounds like it would really fit your your needs. I'm getting the sense this is not something that calls to a lot of people. Is that, am I getting that right? Um, I think there's sure. too much lack of information to know whether somebody might be interested or not for a little bit more definitive, such as the previous speaker said, uh, how to uh, use computers. I think you might get a better response the more specific you are. Right. So, so it sounds like what we might want to start with um, would be to have a couple people who are interested think about what kind of offerings we might want to make and then come back to the group and reach out to people. Does that make sense? <clears throat> um, John, would you would you be interested in being on that team? John yes, Campbell? Absolutely. Excellent. Well, are there other people who'd like to be on that team of organizers, troublemakers? <laughs> revolutionaries uh, Adam I know that one thing that I've kind of said see, see, let, let me just ask that question though okay. before we move on are, are there other people who would like to be part of that team I think so I would like to be excellent so Jay and John other people I'd look into it excellent Norm uh, I, I would love to be part of it we've got about four people there <clears throat> um Let's make a point of talking about this and working on it. And as other people express their interest, uh, we we'd love to we'd love to do that. Steve, you wanted to say something? Yeah. So one of the things that I've been trying to work on with my the the BNUG WordPress group is that eventually we want to move from um, doing our meetings online to doing our meetings at the one of the public libraries. Um, so holding like a structural type meeting. So that anybody who would be interested in learning WordPress could join us at one of the library locations, but just the time and people. Adam? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so we have existing programs. We have the WordPress group. We have this meeting. We definitely have things to offer right now, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking in, in the spirit of what the people were talking about protesting and petitioning, which I think is a, a really worthwhile project. And I encourage people here who want to pursue that to talk with other people who care about this and to, to think about political organizing. I think talking with the union would be a really good idea, uh, a, a really good step forward there. Um, uh, but I, I think that, uh, and, and brainstorming about this, and this is something we can talk about amongst ourselves, 
but I, I love the idea of this group being part of this, this the, the effort to change this. And so to, to close, we've got just a few more minutes. Uh, I wanted to ask people to think about this question about measurement and ask, how do we measure success? And maybe I'd ask that question about our own profession because uh, Tom is pointing out that libraries have learned to measure their success incorrectly. How do we computer people measure our success? The number of people who learn from us. Yeah, the number of calls that I successfully complete in a day. Uh, the number of, uh, I shouldn't say calls, but incidents in my work. Um, well, more important than by, that. Uh, the service management system. The number yes. of processes you put into uh, something useful. The number of accolades I get from coworkers and my managers. More, more specifically though, Cherise, uh, is um, whether or not the actual customer or requester thinks that the need was met. That, well, see, they get that feedback from the end users. Okay, that's important, rather than say some manager's impression. Well, yeah, because the, the, the managers ping the end users, how did Cherise do on that call? Perfect. At least they're supposed to anyway. Around, around time for raises, sure. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> measure my own, can, can people hear me? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Okay, yeah. um, uh, I measure my own success at the, my ability to teach the person I'm talking to how to do something that they just, just didn't know how to do. And it's usually so simple, you know, a problem, a, a, a person who, t who wants to upgrade from Windows 7 to 10 and thinks it's going to be a very expensive business and thinks it's going to be very, very complicated. And I give them a, a, a simple website address in Microsoft that allows them to do exactly what they need to do for free and in just a few hours. And he transformed the system from Windows 7 to Windows 10. He preserved all of his applications. He was just so happy. And he had been looking for weeks trying to figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to mention on the, I, I, I became the administ uh, 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 administrator of a group that does exactly that, that provides free help for people doing um, the, the, the kind of things that I'm talking about. And, um, and he noticed the discussion. He said, wow. And I spent some time talking to him on, you know, in chat about what to do. And he just was completely bowled over. That's the, that's the you know, when I, when I, when I see that, I, that makes me happy. And that's a measure of success. Got it. Um, anyone else want to comment on how they measure their success as a computer helper? Well, I want to echo what John just said. Um, uh, although I, I, you know, I think money does matter because if I weren't uh, able to, you know, make a profit, I wouldn't be in business. Right. Um, so I, I don't think one can completely dis discount that. No, um, it's not. It's not a question of discounting it. It's a question of concentrating on what's important. The rest will fall of its own accord. No, no, no. Trees, I don't disagree. Uh, I run my business. I mean, I feel unbelievably lucky that there's a demand for my services to help people with their computers. And yes, uh, I'm happy that I'm making money. <clears throat> I'm also thrilled that I get joy out of my work every day. Yes. Um, and I've, I've once in a while in my previous so-called career as a software engineer, um, had a, 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 you know, an uncomfortable, if not horrible job situation and was at least glad to get out of it, you know, relatively soon at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so my measure is both how happy I am, as well as how happy my customers are, and also how many customers I have that, um, you know, we work together well. And I, so I have, you know, worked out over the years how to shed clients who are, you um, uh, not, not just, uh, you know, curmudgeons, you know, who can have their charm and their grudging <laughs> um, minimal praise of what one does for them. The people who are actively um, toxic, you know, for me to work yep. with. Yep. Um, so, so those are, you know, if you will, you know, 
minimal toxic is sort of a negative measurement, uh, or <laughs> a double negative measurement. Uh, but I don't discount that because uh, you know they, they can really ruin your day. You know, one toxic person can feel like they have, might evaporate. You know, a week's worth of wonderful work. So um, that, that's my measurement for myself. Mm. So um, we should uh, probably wrap up here, but I, I encourage people to be thinking about the lessons of the library, the co-op, and our profession. Uh, mm. I, I've heard people say things like, I wish the people at Google weren't measuring their success based on how much money they're making. I wish that the library wasn't measuring its success by how many books are in circulation. I wish that the Boston Co-op hadn't worried about its sales instead of focusing on its members. And I think the question, I always find that the best way to teach people is by good example. And so thinking about our own work and thinking about opportunities we have to demonstrate good, good metrics, uh, measuring the right, measuring things that really matter and that really oh. help people um, is, um, is a, a beautiful thing. So I really encourage people to be thinking about this and, uh, and talking about it. I look forward to seeing people at the other meetings that are going on. Um, Steve, do you have an announcement? We can't hear you though. Yep, sorry. Um, the board meeting, the board meeting for the Boston Networkers Group, which we'd love to have everybody join us because this is where we really put things together for each and every uh, monthly membership meeting. Will be it's held on, on Tuesday, right, Steve? I have the twenty second. I'm teasing. <laughs> okay, well, I have the twenty second. Our meetings are in the evening, so that working people can come to them. <laughs> Seven p.m. <laughs> Seven p.m. Seven thirty, right? Seven thirty. Yeah. Okay, uh, and just so you know, also the Boston Network User Group Special Interest Group of WordPress will be meeting every Wednesday evening from four to five, just before the Get Connected Clinic, which Adam runs on Wednesday evening. Um, and then Tuesday at noon time, Adam runs a, a really, really, really awesome, I can't stress it enough, an awesome uh, web for business class where we are learning uh, HTML for those who are really interested. And I think this is a really good class and we've been learning an awful great lot of stuff. And uh, so I encourage you to get involved. Um, all this information can be found on our really awesome website, which I put together with Tom St. Cyr called Boston Network News Club, otherwise known as org. So please check out the website. Use it. We'd love to have your feedback on the website, of course, too. And check out all the great stuff going on here at the Boston Network User Group. Back to I, you, Adam. Thank you. Um, I also want to invite um, any all of the people here who are interested in education. We're doing a very unusual project of teaching teachers in Rwanda. Um, we have a project. If you have to get up very early on Sunday morning, at 7:30 in the morning on Sunday, because their time zone is eight hours ahead, um, and we're helping teachers in a rural school in Rwanda who've never used computers before. It's a very interesting, exciting computer opportunity, and you're all welcome to join us. So if you are, are interested in uh, joining that project, please let me know. Martin, did you want to say something? Two things. Um, uh, John, I put my info in the chat if you'd like to connect one-on-one -on -one when you have time. Um, sure. Um, Adam, I was completely unaware that you were teaching this class. It's, it is not mentioned in the BNUG email newsletter. Could we, um, is it not under the auspices of BNUG? Right, so, so there are a couple of different projects going on. One of them is the Get Connected project on Wednesday from five to seven, which is an ADBAR, a longstanding ADBAR project that's not a BNUG project. The Rwanda project is an ADBAR project. Um, and so um, I'm just mentioning it here because I know a lot of people have an interest. Uh, right, but that's, that's not what I'm asking. Steve Provost mentioned this other thing you're doing, uh, or is it the Rwanda project, the HTML thing? I think he's talking about the- There's a lot going on. And so I think your point, your general point, Martin, is we need a, we need to kind of a central place where all this stuff is. Well, Adam, you know, this is a chance for you to increase your SEO. It's so true, it's so true. <laughs> so, uh, so I'd be happy, anyone who would like to be on I have a, a general offering list, which is both stuff at BNUG, but also stuff outside of BNUG. Anyone who'd like to be on that list, if you would just put your name in the chat and say, I'd like to be on the offering list. And then I'll add you to, I'll make sure that you get that list and you can pick and choose which project you're interested in. Great. Offering? 
offering offering okay. so so i like to use the word you know this is sort of what, what i was talking about earlier about what bina could do we're in the world offering our services in various ways to people or offering our our work or our ideas and so our company has an offering list and uh and i'll be happy to send it to people who are who, who are interested we have a spanish class who went for business class the rwanda project the clinic um on wednesdays um and we'd love to have people learn about those things and participate yeah and uh, what adam was talking about martin was the uh on tuesday afternoon at noon time we have what's called the web for business class where we are learning uh html which is hypertext markup languages for building websites. So that's what I was referring to. Uh, okay, well, actually, as, as long as it's on this list, I'm happy to, to check it out. Yeah, I'll put it on the list and people can check it out. Please ask them any questions. I want to thank everybody for coming to what I think is a really important meeting. Um, I is, is David still here? David Vieira? Um, uh, I don't see him. I think he stepped up. Um, Tom, I just want to thank you very much for coming and helping us understand this issue better. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry I had to drop out for a little while there. I got hung up at a baseball game, but um, that's ha the, happy to follow up with any other questions. Um, terrific. Um, mm. I uh, feel Tom, free to, I, I think you have my email address if you want to share it with the group. And, Tom, and if you want to put your, your email in the chat. If you want, yeah, I'll do that right now. Tom, Tom is really knowledgeable about not only the Boston Public Library, but he's spearheaded some extraordinary digital projects including a worldwide crowdsourcing of transcribing the letters of the New England abolitionists. That's yeah. really special that he invented himself um, and has been enormously successful. Um, you can um, uh, email him and get more information about the project. If you're interested in issues about digitization, about the future of libraries, Tom is a really great person um, to speak with. Um, and I'd be happy to, yes, thank you.